Good day, everybody. Welcome. Today I'm going to propose that one way that we can all help bring peace to the world is to nurture peace within ourselves. Now that may at times seem like a cop-out from doing the hard work in the world, like marching for peace, or going to jail because you didn't pay your taxes, supporting a war, or speaking out when your life might be in danger. Because after all, that is something that a lot of the activists that I really admire in my life did. People like Martin Luther King Jr., King Gandhi, Rabbi Heschel, Dorothy Day, the amazing Malala. They all gave their time, their energy, and it, their lives for peace. And there's no way I'm going to be able to live up to that level of commitment. But I still believe that I will do more to nurture peace in the world if I nurture peace in myself. Now, building peace from the inside out is something that Lisa Parker and everybody at Peace State Philly have been doing for the time I've been involved with them. And it's also at the heart of the philosophy of Stoicism. So today, in honor of a new partnership between the Ethical Society and Philadelphia Stoa, the group in Philadelphia that studies sto and discusses Stoicism and tries to live it, I'm going to share some reflections on Stoicism and peace. And I hope that it helps us all build peace in the world. And I encourage you to check out Philadelphia Stoa at 2 o'clock today. We're going to have an informal conversation, but twice a month at 2 p.m. on Sundays. They're upstairs in our building talking about that. Now, had you known me as a kid, you might not believe that I ended up becoming somebody active for peace because war dominated my playtime. My living room rug was full of toy soldiers. My room had a collection of G.I. Joes, the first action figures glorifying militarism. I posed them and dressed them in various stages of military garb. When my mother finally kicked me out of the house to go play outside, I grabbed my cap gun, or better yet, my Johnny 7. Now, my Johnny 7 was this massive plastic machine gun that was advertised as killing in seven ways, all right? <laughs> It was a rifle, a Tommy gun, a pistol, a hand grenade launcher, an anti-armor shell, an anti-tank gun, and an anti-bunker gun. It didn't even mention that there was a little stiletto knife that came out the back. <laughs> and my friends and I battled all over the neighborhood, running through yards, yelling, I shot you, you're dead. As I became a teenager, I just switched that over to board games. And I would play Stratego and Risk and Battle Cry and Dogfight and Broadside. And I watched a lot of movies about war, The Guns of Navarone, The Great Escape, The Dirty Dozen. But it was only when the protests for the Vietnam War began to rock two of the cities that I lived in that I began to really pay more attention. And then when the nightly news began to scroll the names of those killed that day after each broadcast, I soon began to understand that war was not a game. I went to my first anti-war rally in 1970, chanting and flashing a peace sign. A decade later, in 1980, I was teaching peace activism at St. Albans School to eighth graders, and I joined Educators for Social Responsibility. I wrote two different peace curriculums for them, I organized a juggle fest for a nuclear freeze, my little creative idea. Poorly attended, but I did get on the local ABC radio. I told the uh, reporter that just like nuclear weapons, as with juggling, if you keep handling them, you're bound to drop one. I thought that was rather cute. So it was during the Reagan administration when I was doing that work and the Cold War had gotten very hot, the Defense Department budget was swelling, militarism was on full display with American troops in Grenada, Libya, Nicaragua, and the policies of violence were growing and I organized debates and panel discussions about peace through strength, which was a term that I argued seemed just to be a euphemism for the culture of war. In 1984, my wife Maureen and I traveled to the Soviet Union with 30 students, and it was walking through a war memorial cemetery in St. Petersburg where mass graves of those who died in the siege of Leningrad were buried in huge 
various huge graves that really sealed my commitment to peace for life. Now, as my family became a reality, my public activism began to take a little bit of a backseat to family life. And in that chaos, I turned to inner peace a little bit more, in particular Mahayana Buddhism. I studied Thich Nhat Hanh, I did some meditation, and I tried to create a sense of equanimity through mindfulness meditation, simply breathing in and breathing out. And it's such a simple, deceptively simple practice that I had, uh, 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 I was surprised at its effect. When I breathed in, I said, breathing in, I breathe in peace. Breathing out, I breathe out anger or fear or anxiety, whatever I needed to get rid of that day. And doing that occasionally made a big difference to my life. I don't have the discipline to do it daily. For me, that breathwork, though, is at the very heart of another hobby that I picked up for peace, and that was yoga. I never have gone to a yoga retreat. I'm still on a pretty low level of yoga. I do yoga one, two. I don't do any headstands. But it is something that is deeply important to me because it reminds me regularly to keep things simple. When life gets complicated or difficult, I remember just to breathe, and it helps me feel inner peace. And I believe it brings greater peace to the world around me, especially in my life, with my family, my friends, and here. Now, obviously, yoga and these other things haven't led me to become mighty contributors to peace. I do what I can. But I hope that the ripples of peace that you send out on a day-to-day -day basis might combine with everybody else's ripples of peace, and eventually a small wave might be founded. That's the hope, at least. We can't build peace alone. And that's why the United Nations declared that on September 21st, it's the International Day of Peace, and that has been the case for many years. Like all institutions, the UN is a human institution, and it's flawed, it's got its weaknesses. Too often, it turns to violence to solve problems. It also can be very political, and there's a inequality of power at the UN, but it's only the second time in history that people around the world gathered to try to build peace. The first time was the League of Nations after World War I, but that actually excluded any non-democracy, so it was already exclusive in that case. But the UN was built on the rubble of World War II. It didn't fundamentally change the world. It didn't eliminate tribalism and greed and bigotry that fuels nationalism and starts wars. And it's terrible, but today nationalism is on the rise again. It's whipped up by global competition and fears about immigrants. So these intolerant ideologues are now seeking more power, like one particular candidate for the presidency and his buddy Oban in Hungary and Turkey's Erdogan, Duarte of the Philippines. This resurgence of violent authoritarianism can feel overwhelming, and I think we're all feeling it now, which is why it's so important to nurture inner peace while trying to build peace in the world. It's a big reason why I served with Peace Day Philly. This small organization has stressed this connection between inner peace, local peace, and global peace. So each year about this time, we try to build peace from the inside out. Now this year, I want to add to it, because every year I speak about peace, I want to talk about peace as found in Stoicism, or as encouraged in Stoicism. Before explaining it, let me give you a little bit of a background for those who don't know much about it. I studied in graduate school, but I recently began studying it more primarily by reading the works of Massimo Piglucci. Uh, I urge you to read his book, particularly this one, A Handbook for New Stoics. It's co-written by Gregory Lopez. It's an ancient Greco-Roman philosophy. It started about 300 BCE in the writings of Zeno. And its name is derived from the term stoa, which means a painted porch or a colonnade. And it represents where people would gather to discuss philosophy. Stoicism is deeply intertwined with public dialogue and civic life. Stoicism emphasizes that a good life is most possible if you live by virtues such as wisdom, courage, moderation, and justice. 
Now, it began as a secular philosophy and was expressed in the words of many thinkers after Zeno, including Seneca, Cicero, and the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius. It's an essentially rational philosophy that urges you to reason well and get a, quote, decent understanding, I like that term, decent, it's not a perfectionist, of how the world works. The Catholic Church adopted a lot of the elements of Stoicism, particularly the emphasis on moderation and self-control, but Christian theology and supernaturalism distorted Stoicism to serve church power, emphasizing that the followers sacrifice and suffer while money collected in Rome. So modern thinkers have renewed interest in classical Stoicism as a secular practice, and it's dedicated particularly to evidence and reason. And those elements have contributed greatly to the cognitive branches of modern psychotherapy, which has helped millions of folks better appreciate the relationship between thoughts, emotions, and behavior. Self-knowledge and understanding can give us tools to reduce our anxiety and stress, and it can nurture clarity and equanimity. In other words, it's helped a lot of people find inner peace. So I'm gonna spend the rest of my time today, most of it, talking about three ways Stoicism tries to do that. One fundamental piece of Stoic advice is that it's a good thing to contemplate the big picture, the big picture, to figure out how we fit into the immensity of the universe and the eternity of time. So let's start with the size of the universe. Scientists say that the observable universe is about 93 billion light years across, and that means that if we were to begin at the edge of what we can observe in the universe and travel across it at the speed of light, we would get to the other side in 46 billion light years. That's huge. And it's expanding, right? It's getting bigger. What about the vastness of time? This universe is said to be about 13.8 billion years old. And that means that if we were to live to 100, which would be pretty good, that would mean that we'd experience only one 138 billionth of the time in this universe. And there are people that say that there are universes before this one. So it's almost inconceivable how much time there is. Maybe it's an understatement to say that eternity is a long time, or maybe that doesn't even make sense, because time is duration and eternity isn't. I don't know. But contemplating that we're just a tiny speck around for just a flash of time can be a bit depressing, especially if you grew up being told that you were gonna live forever. If you were told about heaven and the afterlife, having that taken away by that broad picture can be hard to process. But the big picture can offer us escape from the anxiety about the temporary challenges in our life. I mean, when I watch CNN and I see the constant breaking news flashing across my screen, my heart rate increases, my breath gets shallow, and we're all taking in so much of that right now. But when you go outside and you look up at that night sky, those temporary challenges begin to fade in importance. Marcus Aurelius explained that history is filled with instances where the present day challenges seem insurmountable. Even in our private lives, we tend to exaggerate the daily challenges. I do it all the time. But Aurelius reminds us that almost always after time passes, the past challenges no longer seem so great. When we remember this, when we place our challenges into the larger frame, we can learn not to sweat the small stuff. Simple advice. Aurelius writes, the agitations that beset you are superfluous and depend wholly upon judgments of your own. You can get rid of them and in so doing, indeed, live at large by embracing the whole universe in your view and comprehending all eternity and imagining the swiftness of change in each particular. Seeing how brief is the passage from birth to dissolution, birth with its unfathomable before, 
disillusioned with its infinite thereafter. I found that this awareness of my tiny, brief existence can accentuate the, precious, the preciousness of my current existence. When I imagine time stretching out forever before and after my existence, sparks of awe and joy come up in me realizing that, hey, I'm here now. I'm here now. I am alive. Acceptance of our insignificance can bring liberation. That was the conclusion of a French philosopher by the name of André Comte Schoenville, who wrote one of my favorite short reads called The Book of Atheist Spirituality. For him, the fact that our existence is dwarfed in time and space creates not pessimism or nihilism, but what he calls cheerful despair. Yeah. Cheerful despair. He says that that is a more noble and bearable appreciation of the human condition. A second way that Stoicism can help nurture inner peace is through understanding what's called the dichotomy of control. The, di the di dichotomy of control. Very simple idea. It's that we can control some things and there are other things we can't control. <laughs> Seems like common sense. We too often ignore it. Let's start with what we can't control. We can't live forever. We can't get to the edge of the universe. And we can't know everything. We can't be certain about very much having to do with the outside world, actually. But admitting that we are far from omniscient relieves us from the burden of having to pretend that we have all the answers. Appreciating our ignorance, the Stoics point out, helps us appreciate also that other people have different perspectives. They see things differently. And that can be liberating because it can open up opportunities to learn and grow. We can find joy in the plethora of perspectives that we all have. Accepting the diversity of human experience can nurture humility and curiosity about other human beings. If you know everything, why care about what anybody else thinks? The humility's evidence in the writings of modern Stoics, Massimo and others, don't promote a single way to live. They admit that there's no one formula to living a good life. And that's in part because we all share many values, but we can't honor all of those values all of the time because they come in conflict all the time. And quite often, only we ourselves can figure out which value we're gonna honor at this particular time. That's another limitation in life. We can't live up to all of our values. I'll give you one example that Immanuel Kant talked about. He talked about, I might value telling the truth and I might value protecting somebody. But what do I have to lie to protect somebody? The Stoics say you can't simply weigh those two and decide which one is heavier at this particular time. They can't be reduced to each other. They're incommensurables. This handbook says that they don't all come with a single currency, so you can compare them by number. So sometimes you cannot honor all your values. So in addition to not being able to live forever, not seeing the whole universe, not honoring all our values, and not being able to control everything. We can't control what other people think, say, or do. That's a good lesson to learn early in life. We can, to a degree, control our own thoughts, words, and actions, but we can't control their effect on others. Despite any good intention we may have, when we do something to help somebody, it may land on them hard. There's no guarantee that what we do is going to impact people as we intend. So given that there's so much we can't do, we might be tempted to throw up our hands and say, no, I'm giving up. But if you make a commitment to build peace, which is a commitment made by Stoics and Buddhists and ethical humanists and many other groups, we have to admit our limitations, but then do what we can do. Focus on the part of the Academy of Control that we have control of. And we can build peace. 
Matthew I. Spetter was an ethical culture leader in 1999. He said, we are not helpless. Peacemaking is our strength, our hope, our ideal. That is where we stand. What we can control then is we can choose to live more fully in the present. We can choose to know ourselves better. We can choose to take setbacks as opportunities to grow and learn. The handbook offers the advice, the obstacle is the way. The obstacle is the way. Many of you who dabble in Buddhism will feel a big similarity there. Uh, all Buddhist teaching that I have seen has helped me when I'm meditating, breathing deep, and then that siren outside goes, and I go, Arr! Thich Nhat Hanh and others will remind me, that's the focus of my meditation today. What a gift. That siren offers me an opportunity to feel my anxiety, breathe it in and out, and let it go. The obstacle is the way. Now that's wrapped up in another part of Stoicism, which is opportunities to enhance controls in our life through practical wisdom. Practical wisdom. That's a term that Aristotle wrote about in the Nicomachean Ethics, and it basically means wisdom that serves us in the real world. Wisdom that's tested through our actions. It often involves ethical decisions and living a good life. Practical wisdom doesn't come to us in a flash of insight, though. It is something that's tested. Our, we're testing our beliefs in the world, and we're honing useful habits. If I tend to do this, what happens in my life? Because before the term religion was used to describe historical institutional forms of worship, in other words, before churches, synagogues, and, and temples took the term religion as their own, the term religio meant practicing, practicing. Cicero introduced the term religio into Latin to mean scrupulous or strict observance of certain practices. So today, developing good habits through repetitions serves as the foundation of a lot of modern cognitive behavior therapy. It's not a magic wand, but these practices that you find in Stoicism as well helps things like visualization exercises, something Massimo says he does. And if there's something you're trying to do and you haven't been able to do it, imagine doing it. It won't make it happen, but it makes it a little easier. Or he also does exercises in mild self-denial. Things like, I won't have that, that second dessert. It's something people do around Lent quite often, and it can develop self-control. He also recommends memorizing some pithy phrases that you can take out of your wallet anytime and sort of use when you need it. Uh, one that I kind of like, which is related to rationalism and stoicism, is decompose impressions. It's a little clunky, but often we have impressions in life. Things happen, and we assume we know what they mean. And the Stoics caution that we should decompose them, break them up into their constituent parts, figures out what's going on, because quite often what we think happened is not actually what happened. And sometimes we have to pause to find out what is really going on. That's related to another phrase that's useful to have, and that is pause anger. We learned that as little kids. Count to 10. The Stoics cheer that phrase. And we can do it in a more reflective way. Massimo says that at the end of every day, he writes in a philosophical journal, particularly about times in the day that he felt angry or acted through anger. And in doing so, it can help him nurture self-control. Seneca writes, anger will cease and become more gentle if it knows that every day it will have to appear before the judgment seat. I love that. Anger. How'd you do today? <laughs> it's not always easy to pause anger, especially if you're trying to build peace. Peace activists are people that are exposed constantly to violence and trauma around the world, and they care deeply about it. So they feel a great deal of anger. Jody Williams, who won a Nobel Peace Prize for her effort to ban landmines, wrote about that. She said, it isn't that I'm just an angry human being. 
It's anger at injustice. I'm still struggling with inner peace and I'm not sure I'll ever work it out. So any technique to diffuse anger, to not let it control you, can help you build the inner peace necessary to be a better peace builder in the world. And we see this in the serenity prayer, right? This has brought peace to millions of people battling various types of addiction. I'm gonna drop out the reference to God part in this. But a few short phrases captures stoic values of temperance and courage and practical wisdom as much as this short prayer. Give me the serenity to accept what cannot be changed, the courage to change what can be changed, and the wisdom to know the difference. We can discuss the toxic elements of Christianity that has filtered into Alcoholics Anonymous. I'll talk more about that another time. But I do think that the program in that phrase helped save my mother's life. So in addition to seeing the big picture and understanding what you can control and what you can't, one other way that Stoicism urges us to nurture inner peace is by centering ethics. Let me explain what I mean by that before saying what its connection to peace is. Centering ethics simply means saying ethics matters. It means trying to choose to live an ethical life. It means honoring justice. Now Stoics down through history have said that centering ethics aligns with human nature because the Stoics argue that we are social creatures. A life lived in harmonious relation with each other is the best life to live because that's the way we are. Life is fundamentally about being a good person. Massimo writes, in a nutshell, the most important thing in life is to maintain moral integrity and be helpful to others. Pretty simple approach. And this is due not just to our social nature, which is an assumption that I accept out of, out of uh, stoicism and a lot of other uh, areas of study, Obviously, there are people who are broken who have trouble with the social relationships. But I think essentially we are social creatures and we are interrelated. That's truth that's focused in on many philosophical relationships. It's a, a part of a lot of religious views and it's also confirmed by modern science. Nothing exists in isolation. Seneca emphasizes the oneness in this passage. There is one short rule that should regulate human relationships. All that you see, both divine and human, is one. We are parts of one great body. Nature created us from the same source and to the same end. She imbued us with mutual affection and sociability. She taught us to be just and fair, to suffer injury rather to inflict it. She bids us to extend our hands to all in need of help. Let that well-known line be in our hearts and on our lips. Nothing human is alien to me. We're not gods. We have to let go of our arrogance and our perfectionism. But there is enough glory just being part of this flawed human family. When we organize in civic groups or cooperative governments, we can have opportunities to become more healthily interrelated. And we can revel in the phrase of one of the first philosophers of Western culture, Socrates, who said, I am a citizen of the world. But when we say that in Stoicism or in ethical humanism, we can't forget that you're also a citizen of a country and you're responsible for that. You're a citizen of groups that you're a part of, you're a part of that. You're a member of friends and family, you're a part of that. So when you build peace from the inside out, you can't just jump to the world. You also have to make sure that that peace benefits those in your life on a day-to-day -day basis. Thich Nhat Hanh knows this well. He wrote, we talk about social service, service to people, service to humanity, service to others who are far away, helping bring peace to the world. But we often forget that it is the very people around us that we must live for first of all. If you cannot serve your wife or husband or child or parent, how are you gonna serve society? If all our friends in the peace movement or service communities of any kind do not love and help one another, whom can we love and help? Are we working for other human beings or are we just working for the name of an organization? We're doing both and we can do it better when we have peace within. 
The interconnections between inner peace and social peace and global peace are strong. They're at the center of Stoicism, they're at the center of ethical culture and many other philosophies. So I'm gonna end with a final quote from Lao Tzu, the Taoist sage. He said, if there's to be peace in the world, there must be peace in the nations. If there's to be peace in the nations, there must be peace in the cities. If there's to be peace in the cities, there must be peace between neighbors. If there's to be peace between neighbors, there must be peace in the home. If there's to be peace in the home, there must be peace in the heart. Thank you very much.